attempts to form a new opposition party by Karl Marx, published November 5, 1852. In the same measure as the hitherto predominating parties dissolved themselves, and as their distinctive marks are effaced, the want of a new opposition party is felt as a matter of course. This want finds an expression in different ways. Lord John Russell, in his already quoted speech, takes the lead. Part of the alarm raised by Lord Derby, he says, had sprung from the rumors that he, Lord J. Russell, had adopted highly democratical opinions. Well, I need not say on that subject that this rumor was totally unfounded, that it has no circumstances on which it raised. Nevertheless, he pronounced himself a democrat, and then explains the harmlessness of the word. The people of this country are in other words the democracy of the country. Democracy has as fair a right to the enjoyment of its rights as monarchy or nobility. Democracy does not mean to diminish any of the prerogatives of the crown. Democracy does not attempt to take away any of the lawful privileges of the House of Lords. What, then, is this democracy? The growth of wealth, the growth of intellect, the forming of opinions more enlightened and more calculated to carry on in an enlightened manner the government of the world. But I will say more. I will say that the manner of dealing with the increase of the position of the democracy could not be according to the old system of restraint, which I was but too familiar. On the contrary, democracy ought to be maintained and encouraged. There ought to be given a legitimate and legal organ to that power and influence. Lord John Russell exclaims, the Morning Herald in reply, has one set of principles for office and another set of principles for opposition, when in office, his principles is to do nothing, and when out of office, to pledge himself to everything. What in all the world may the Morning Herald mean by nothing, if it calls the above trash pronounced by Lord John Russell everything, and if it menaces little John Russell for his king-loving, lord-respecting, bishop-conserving democracy with the fate of Frost, Williams, and co.? But the humor of the thing is that Lord Derby, in the House of Lords, announces himself as the proponent of democracy, and speaks of democracy as the only party against which it is worth while to struggle. And in steps the inevitable John Russell with an examination of what democracy is, for example, the growth of wealth, of the intellect of this wealth, and of its claims to influence government through public opinion and through legal organs. Thus, then, democracy is nothing but the claims of the bourgeoisie, the industrious and commercial middle class. Lord Derby stands up as an opponent. Lord John Russell volunteers as the standard-bearer of this democracy. Both of them agree in the implicit confession that the ancient feuds within their own class, the aristocracy, are no longer of any interest to the country and Russell is quite prepared to drop the name of Whig for that of Democrat, if this be the conditio sine qua non for turning his opponents out. The Whigs, in this case, would in fact continue to play the same part, and appear officially as the servants of the middle class. Thus, Russell's plan of a party reorganization is confined to the adoption of a new party name. Joseph Hume, too, considers the formation of a new People's Party a necessity, but he says that on tenant right and similar propositions it cannot be formed. On these matters, you could not muster a hundred out of the 654 members to unite. What, then, is his nostrum? The People's League, or party, or union, must agree on one point, say the ballot, and after carrying that one point, proceed from step to step to other points. And while the movement must begin with a few individual members of the House of Commons, it cannot succeed until the people out of doors and electors shall see the necessity of doing their part and of giving support to the small party of the people in Parliament. This same Hume was one of the drawers up of the People's Charter. From the People's Charter and its six points he retreated to the Little Charter of the financial and parliamentary reforms with only three points, and now we see him reduced to one point, the ballot. What success he promises to himself from his new nostrum, he will tell us himself 
in the concluding words of his letter to the whole advertiser, tell me now how many editors will risk to give their support to a party that as Parliament is now composed can never succeed to power. Now, as this new party does not mean to change for the present anything in the composition of Parliament, but confines itself to the ballot, which will, by its own confession, never succeed to power. What is the good of forming a party of impotence, and of openly confessed impotence? Next to Joseph Hume, there is another attempt made for the creation of a new party. This so-called national party, instead of the people's charter, this party would make universal suffrage its exclusive sibboleth, and thus leave out those very conditions which can alone make the movement for universal suffrage a national movement and secure to it popular support. I shall hereafter have occasion to recur to this national party. It consists of ex-chartists who wish to conquer respectability for themselves and of radicals, middle-class ideologists, who wish to get hold of the chartist movement. Behind them, whether nationalists are aware of it or not, you find the parliamentary and fiscal reformers, the men of the Manchester School, urging them on and using them as their vanguard. Now what cannot be evident to everyone, in all this miserable compromises and backslidings, these huntings after weekly expediencies, these vacillations and cacostra, is this. Catiline is at the gates of the city, a decisive struggle is drawing near, the opposition knows, its unpopularity, its incapacity for resistance, and all the attempts at the formation of new centers of defense agree in one point only, in a going backwards policy. The National Party retreats from the Charter to general suffrage, Joe Hume from general suffrage to the ballot, a third from the ballot to the equalization of electoral districts, and so forth until at last we arrive at Johnny Russell, who has nothing to give out for a battle cry but the mere name of democracy. Lord J. Russell's democracy would be, practically speaking, the ultimate tomb of the National Party of Hume's People's Party and all other party shams if any one of them had anything like vitality about it. But on one hand, the political flaccidity and indifference consequent upon a period of material prosperity, on the other hand, the conviction that nevertheless the Tories are menacing mischief. On one hand, the certainty, on the part of the bourgeois leaders, that they will very soon require the people to back them. On the other hand, the knowledge acquired by some popular leaders that the people are too indolent to create, for the moment, a movement of their own. All these circumstances produce the phenomena that parties attempt to make themselves acceptable to each other, and that the different factions of the opposition out of Parliament attempt a union by making each other concessions from the most advanced faction downwards until, at last, they again arrive at what Lord J. Russell is pleased to call democracy. Of the attempts to create a self-styled national party, Ernest Jones justly remarks, The People's Charter is the most comprehensive of political reform in existence, and the Chartists are the only true national party of politic and social reforms in Great Britain. And A.G. Gamage, one of the members of the Chartist executive, thus addressed the people. Would you then refuse the cooperation of the middle classes? Certainly not. If that cooperation is offered on fair and honorable terms, and what are these terms? That they are easy and simple. Adopt the Charter, and having adopt the Charter, unite with its friends who are already organized for its achievement. If you refuse to do this, you must either be opposed to the Charter itself, or piquing yourselves upon your class superiority, you must imagine that superiority to entitle you to leadership. In the first case, no honest chartist can unite with you. In the second, no working man ought so far to love his self-respect as to succumb to your class prejudice. Let the working man trust their own power alone, receiving honest aid from whatever sources but acting as though their salvation depended upon their own exertions. The mass of the Chartists, too, are at the present moment absorbed by material production, but 
on all points the nucleus of the party is reorganized and the communications re-established in england as well as in scotland and in the event of a commercial and political crisis the importance of the present noiseless activity at the headquarters of charterism will be felt all over britain <laughs>